All right. So it's uh, it's been a long 50 days. All right. It's been a long 50 days. Uh, not for me in 2021. I'm talking about the disciples, right? We read out of Acts chapter 2 today. We're going to be in there for the rest of the service. Uh, but it's been a long 50 days. About 50 days ago in this time, they were with Jesus in the upper room. He was talking to them, especially just what uh, Pastor Tony shared last week. He was telling them that there will be another advocate will come. Oh, sorry. The uh, youth, they can go with Tony. I missed that, but he got them. So you guys are good. If you're in here still youth, you want to go with Tony, you can head out those doors. Uh, Last week, again, Pastor Tony talked about this promise that Jesus said that when I go, another advocate will come. I will send the Holy Spirit and he he will guide you into all truth. He will prove the world wrong about sin and about righteousness and about justice. Judgment and, and don't let your hearts be troubled. I will send you another advocate. He promised that the Father would send the Holy Spirit to be with them and to guide them. Just immediately after that time, as he's with his disciples in the upper room, he goes out to the garden. And when they're there, all of a sudden Judas shows up and betrays him. Jesus is arrested. He's taken before uh, the local leadership and they accuse him of blasphemy and they sentence him uh, to be crucified. And Jesus is, he's beaten, he's whipped, he's eventually nailed on a cross. And the disciples who were there with him in the upper room, walked with him for three years, saw the miracles, saw the healings, heard the teachings. Now they're witnessing their, their master, their Messiah, their teacher hanging on a cross. Three days later, well, after, after he was hanging on the cross, they put him and buried him in a tomb. And three days later, the women rushed with spices to go and to prepare the body And they realized he wasn't there. When they showed up at the tomb, that's Easter Sunday, they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? That was only like three days after that upper room discourse. And then Jesus, he rose from the grave and he talked to them and he met with them for about 40 days. He taught them different things about the kingdom of God. He told them about when God would put someone back on the throne of King David. And they asked him, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom? This is Acts chapter 1. He said, no, there's just don't worry about that, but don't worry. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, then in Judea and then in Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascended into heaven and they watched him go. And they said, don't worry, the same way he left, he will come back. But wait for him. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait. And so they go to Jerusalem and they're waiting for 10 days, praying and waiting, praying and waiting. It's been a long 50 days. Imagine those 10 days, the exhilarating ups and downs, the highs, the lows of seeing your teacher nailed to a cross to then see him brought back, raised to new life and for him to teach you once again, but then to leave you and say, don't worry, someone else is coming. I will send you, send him to you and you will receive power. And so they're waiting and waiting for God to show up. And I love how God shows up. Are you ready to go with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 1? The three of you, great. What about the rest of you? Are you ready to go? (laughs) Acts chapter 2, verse 1. This is when God shows up, right? God doesn't show up and just, oh, we'll just get there. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came. All right, let's stop right there. I only have uh, 32 minutes. It's going to be a long, a long 32 minutes. No, I'll I'll go quick. Maybe we can extend it by two hours um, to get through all this. (laughs) When the day of Pentecost came, let me just stop there. I know, we'll, we'll get through it and we'll make it through it in time, I promise. The day of Pentecost is one of three pilgrimage holidays. Now, when Jesus was in the upper room teaching them, they were celebrating what holiday? Passover. A couple of you got it. Great. Yeah. They were celebrating Passover. That was the great and glorious day when God rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt through Moses. Hey, Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh goes, no, 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 no. And then he does like the whole Pharaoh dance or whatever. All right. Let my people go. And then he brought them out of slavery in Egypt. They wandered in the desert and they made it 50 days later. They arrived at Mount Sinai. And all of a sudden God came down to meet with the people. And on top of the mountain, there was fire and there was smoke and earthquakes and everything was shaking. God had to say, put a line in the sand. Anyone across it, they will die. Literally, he said, put a line in the sand. And God showed up in power and he gave Moses the law, the 10 commandments. In other words, this, if you're going to be my people, this is how you live as my people. I will give you a guide map. I'll give you a road guidelines, how to follow me as my people. Pentecost is the celebration of, or the, uh, the memory, the commemorization of, I don't know, said that word wrong. They remembered when God gave the law at Mount Sinai. That's Pentecost. It's 50 days after Passover. And so they're there. And I said, it's a pilgrimage holiday because there were three of them. 
Passover, Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll talk about that when we talk about, I don't know, Tabernacles or something like that. But the point is, every year the Jewish father would take his family and they would travel to Jerusalem for Pentecost, then they would, for, for Passover, then they would go home. And then 50 days later, they would gather the family and they would take the family back to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. It's an agricultural holiday celebrating the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, the blessing of God to give his people a way of life, the law, the Ten Commandments. And so they're there at the day of Pentecost. Okay, let's keep going. And when they were there, they were all together in one place. In verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them pretty powerful. God just showed up. And it wasn't in like this little quiet, like shaking box in the corner, like, hi, I'm God, I'm here. It was like a violent blowing wind. It was like a violent blowing wind. How many of you were here last Sunday in Springfield when it felt like all the trees were going to blow down? A couple of you raised your hand. I got back from the gym. I came upstairs and Sarah was like this out the window. <laughs> one of them's coming down. It's that one. I'm like, no, it's not. All right. But the sound was like, like blowing violent wind. When God shows up, he's going to let everyone know he's coming. Because when he first came in Exodus at Mount Sinai, the whole mountain shook. Fire came down and smoke. And everyone's like, God is there. He's on that mountain. And Moses is like, I guess I'm going up. All right. And now God shows up and it's a blowing sound like the blowing of a violent wind. This is an Old Testament connection to God showing up. In fact, the word spirit, we're talking about Holy Ghost. Spirit means wind or breath. But the, for it to be a powerful, violent, blowing wind, it has carrying power. It suggests that now they are being filled with power for service. They are now ready to go out and serve the Lord Another unusual sign that's connected to the Old Testament is, is this fire, right? It says tongues of fire. It's like this mass flame came down over the group and then, and then split apart. It looked like little licks of fire over each and every one of them. It's an Old Testament connection to worship. When God would approve of a sacrifice offered, fire would come down and consume it. So in a way, what's happening here is God is accepting the worship of this people. This is the, off this is the offering. This is the sacrifice. A new people is just waiting for God, giving their lives over to him. He's like, I accept this offering. Fire comes down. This is my new people. This body of believers that is gathered here, who are waiting, who are praying, you are acceptable to me. And then as it splits and lights over each one of them, you are now all individual temples of the Holy Spirit. And as you gather, you are the temple of of the Holy Spirit. And what happens there? They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, just as the Spirit gave utterance. And I know what you're thinking. Ooh, what's he going to say about tongues, right? Because commentaries always focus on tongues. Usually preaching focuses on tongues. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, I don't know. So what are these tongues? Are they known languages? I don't know. Are they other tongues, right? Like angelic tongues? I don't know. Are they unknown languages? I don't know. That's not the point of this passage. We'll talk about tongues next week. So if you come back, a little teaser, we'll, give, we'll talk about it. We're going to talk about gifts of the Spirit next week. All right? So a little teaser. Come back next week. The point is, though, is that the Holy Spirit is doing something new. He's giving a new language, if you will. He's filling those people who are waiting. And while they're there, he's the one who gives them utterances. And they're declaring, they end up declaring the wonders of God. And the point is, the Spirit is giving a new language to a new people who are acceptable before the Lord. And let's keep going and see what happens. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Th that's not a compliment. Aren't all those Galilean folks out there in Podunk, Galilee? I was a horrible southern accent, but, you know, I tried. Was it okay, honey? No, it wasn't that good. All right. She's from Texas, so I get the y'alls in my house. All right, this is an agricultural festival. These people, these Galileans, probably had the long wheat coming out of their mouth. You know, overalls walking in. Hey, y'all, what we all doing here, right? We're here for Pentecost, all right? Now, I love those people, and I'm not really trying to, like, you know, make fun of those people. But the point is, they're, they weren't really learned folk, all right? They weren't, like, scholars or academics. Basically, they wouldn't have known the languages. And the people are saying, 
Wait, aren't aren't they from Galilee? Aren't they Galileans? Don't they don't they farm? Aren't they fishermen? Like they don't study languages. Like they all knew the commercial language, like the or the language of commerce, the 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 everyday Greek, so you could actually buy and sell and trade in the marketplace. People knew that, but like, how are they speaking in our own languages? He says we've heard them in our own native language. And now here's all the group of people who were there. Parthians, Medes, Elamites. I'm just going to stop there. Remember, if you don't know how to pronounce these and you're reading these at home, just fake it until you make it and you'll be good. <laughs> Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Oh, it was an exclamation mark. I'll yell next time, I promise. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. In the NLT, they are drunk, all right, or new wine, okay? What's going on here? Remember, all these people were there because of Pentecost. I tried to say that. Remember, a pilgrimage holiday. Gather the family. We're going to Jerusalem. We're going to celebrate Pentecost. We're going to celebrate uh, the time when God gave us his law. And we're going to bring our, our first, the first fruits of our harvest. And we're going, to, we're going to get a paycheck because we're bringing our harvest to the local city. We're going to Jerusalem. They're there because of that. If you look at this theologically, this, this is like a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. So in Genesis chapter 11, there, was, there were humans and they all spoke the same language and they said, we want to basically build a tower and reach the heavens. We want to become gods in a way. And they built this tower and they got it really high and God saw their wickedness and rebellion and he says, you are not gods. I created your creatures. And so God scattered them all throughout the world and he confused them with different languages. And I love now how what God is doing, he is now, he is gathering those who have been scattered with a new language given by his spirit to bring about, again, a new community here in this world. And so the covenant promises that went to Abraham and then went through to Moses and then went through to David are now being fulfilled when the spirit was poured out here on the day of Pentecost. And as these promises go to this group of people, they will be extended from them out into the world as those people who are filled with the spirit go out and spread the gospel throughout the world. Basically, those who were previously excluded are now brought in and swept into this Jesus movement by the gift of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And like we said before, the tongues of Pentecost declare the wonders of God. They were praised. They were worshipped. God gave them utterances to praise his name, to talk about the greatness of God in the midst of their corrupt generation. They declare the wonders of God. And that's why people are perplexed. That's why they are amazed. That's why they mock them. That's why they go, those people must be drunk. Because they don't understand the purpose of this. They could hear their own language. They heard the wonders of God, but they didn't understand why is all this happening? How do you know? Or how, you might be wondering, how do you know that that's what they're thinking? Well, they asked, what does this mean? In verse 12, and I love Peter. Anyone else love Peter? Yeah. All right. My mouth runs a lot. All right. You can ask my wife. Sometimes she's like, you need to just stop it. Just stop it right now. And I'm like, what are you talking All right. But if Jesus loves Peter and if he has a place in the church, I know God loves me and I have a place in the church. So thank you, Peter, for all the other people with, uh, you know, Peter vibes out there. All right. Preach. Verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11 and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. He's like, you guys think it's five o'clock somewhere, but it's actually 9 a.m. right here. All right, they like to get the party started. We know that, but they're going to wait till later on in the day. They would celebrate with wine and stuff. It's the harvest, right? The, the new grapes are in town, okay? But that's later in the day. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. Listen to what I say. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In other words, God promised this 
long ago. He promised to pour out his spirit as he's making a new people, a new group of people who follow him with his spirit. In the last days, and this is right from Joel chapter two, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy and I will show them wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter says, I know you can't understand this. I don't, I know you don't know the purpose of this, but, but basically let me tell you this is that God is doing something new and this was promised in the days of old. So what does this mean? This means that this Holy Spirit is now open to all people. The gift of the Spirit is open to all people. Notice how he starts there. Sons and daughters will prophesy. I love how he starts with young people. All right, maybe because I, I, I was a youth pastor. Maybe you can't ever take the youth pastor out of the pastor, okay? And I just love, I love how, I love how it starts here with young people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. I just want to remind you, when our youth, all right, I see some younger people in the room, I see some really younger people in the room, which is so cute, all right? Um, when, when God pours out his spirit on young people, they don't get the spirit of junior high Jesus, Right? They don't get like the 12 year old, I'm about my father's business in the temple, Jesus, right? They get the actual full Holy Spirit in their lives. My six year old understands that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. He understands that because it's not just some partial, I'm going to give him sixth grade Jesus or a six year old Jesus right now, and the next year he'll get seven year old you know, Holy Spirit or whatever. No, they get the, whole, the fullness of God. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives inside when our youngest of, of people give their lives to the Lord. And they will prophesy. Do we want our young people to prophesy and speak truth into our church? Are we allowing our young people to prophesy and speak truth into our church? He goes on to say, young men see visions and old men dream dreams. In other words, he's saying, let's break down the age barrier here. If you have a little bit more wisdom dusted on your hair than me, all right, you can't retire from the Christian life. Come on, we need the old people in our congregation to dream dreams. Come on, to see visions. We need the young people to see visions, old people, dream dreams for us. Come on, reach out to some, someone who's younger than you and tell them you love them. Tell them you're praying for them. Tell them you want to take them out to coffee. I have a, lot, a really open schedule on Thursdays. Um, if you want to. <laughs> then he says, servants, men and women. Again, this is all people. It doesn't matter where you are in the socioeconomic status. The Holy Spirit is for all people, open for all people, willing to be given to all people. There's already everyone from every, uh, every nation in the known world, not every literal nation, okay, but the, the known world at the time were there, all right? So it doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter what you are, the Holy Spirit is open to anyone who would receive the Holy Spirit. And then it says, what does this mean? This also means that the gift of salvation is open to all people. It says it there in Joel and it repeats it here in Acts is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Peter is saying, look, what you guys are hearing now, what you're seeing, uh, what's going on in this group, it, it, it's just proof that the spirit is open to all people and that salvation is open to all people. But let me tell you why this happened, why the spirit is open to all people, why salvation is available for all people. And he says it in verse 22. People of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Well, this is awesome. I want to say amen to that. Verse 25, <clears throat> God, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. 
You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers and sisters, we all know that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here today. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. He quotes, he quotes David there to say David didn't actually fulfill this. David was prophesying about his descendant. And he will get into who that descendant will be. Seeing what was to come, David, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David didn't ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Therefore... Let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Messiah and Lord. Why did this happen? Peter says, because Jesus was raised from the dead and he is now exalted as the world's true Lord and Israel's forever king. All this is taking place because Jesus rose from the dead. The event on Easter was a ground-shaking, earth-shaking, universe-changing event. When Jesus rose from the grave, that changed everything. And he says, we were a witness to the fact. And because he was raised and exalted to the right hand of God, he has given and poured out the spirit which God the Father promised to give. He's like, Jesus is raised from the dead. That's why all this is happening. He is the world's true Lord and he is Israel's rightful true king. And look how they responded. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? shall we do in light of Jesus being raised from the dead and in pouring out the spirit that was promised long ago what shall we do and this is how Peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord will call with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Peter gives them a quick little, quick little formula. He says, repent. It's a churchy word. Maybe we've overused it, but I, I still think it's valid. Repent, it means turn. Basically, you're on your own way, following your own plan for your own life, trying to build your own kingdom, trying to make it all about you. And he says, turn, repent, and get on God's way. Get on God's plan. Be part of his great rescue of the world. When Jesus was raised from the dead on Easter, it was saying God's new world has broken into the presence. So present. So, so come alive in God's new world. You have to turn away from your own kingdom, building your own plan for your own life, and get on God's plan for your life. Turn and get on what God is doing. Follow out his mission. And then he says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of sins. That they were all probably baptized in the name of John. Right, John the Baptist baptized people. And he said, but there's going to be one coming later than I, after me, who he's like, I'm not even worthy to, to like get down and untie his sandals. Like, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Oh, that's another promise that's being fulfilled right here as well. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. I, I will always say this. I don't think baptism is just telling the world that you follow Jesus. According to scripture, baptism is you participating in the death of Jesus, going under the water with him in his death and coming up out of the water in the newness of the life that he offers. That's in several places in the New Testament where Paul will tease out his baptism theology. Basically, you have to participate when Jesus died and death could no longer hold him and then you raise to new life with him and you're walking out the newness of life and that's when, third, number three, you will receive the gift of the Spirit coming to newness of life, having the, the full presence of Jesus in your life, the Holy Spirit to empower you to walk out this life. 
And I love how when they, when they preach that the, the Jesus is raised from the dead, they see the power of the Spirit. 3,000 people give their life to the Lord that day. Talk about like a church growth plan, right? <laughs> Preaching Jesus is raised from the dead, showing the power of the Spirit, and watching people respond to the message. If that's not a conviction for the, the church today, uh, I don't know what else is. And that's our story. That's what happens when the promise of the Father arrives. But I, wanna, I want us to figure out how we can experience Pentecost today. So experiencing Pentecost today. Here's kind of the big thing I think we can get from this whole text is that the Holy Spirit creates a new me, a new us, and a new humanity so that we can carry out Jesus' mission here on earth. And I personalize it because when you say that to yourself, I, I want you to truly mean it. When you give yourself to Christ and you put your trust in him, he actually creates, he makes you new. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. You have been made new in the Holy Spirit. But it's also a new us because the Spirit was poured out on a group of people who were waiting in prayer, waiting for the Lord to send the promised Spirit. So there's a new us that has to be created. And ultimately a new humanity, a new way to be human in this world so that we can do what? Not so we can kind of create flashy programs and have really fun things to do on the 29th of October. No, he, he does all this so we can carry out Jesus' mission here on earth. We get to be the very tangible presence of God in this world. Oh, it's a, it's a highly respond, like there's a lot of responsibility attached to that. But that's what it means to follow Jesus, to be willing to, to carry his mission to, in our church, here in our local community, and then all around the world as we partner with people who are already doing that. Carrying out the Lord's mission, we get to continue God's rescuing project Remember, it started with Abraham. It was climax in, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when he gave us the spirit, he says, now, in other words, handing the baton, I, you're no longer building your kingdom. As I am building my kingdom, you get to participate in that. Preach about a new kingdom. Preach about a new king. Show the, show the wild forgiveness of the new kingdom. Show the wild healing that takes place in the kingdom of God. Tell the freedom from addiction that happens in the kingdom of God. Let the mission of Jesus become your mission. It's, that's what's a co-mission. And go. Be new creation people in God's new world. And here's some things to remind us. When the Holy Spirit begins to move in our lives, be prepared for wind and fire. Yeah. Be prepared for wind and fire. Sometimes the work of the Holy Spirit is loud. Sometimes the work of the Spirit is noisy. Sometimes there's some things in your life that need to be shaken up and rearranged. Right? Again, it wasn't a real wind, but the sound was crazy, right? Exhilarating, freakishly, okay? It was a blowing, violent wind. Again, the work of the Spirit might be loud in your life. It might need to shake some things up. It might need to, to, to take you somewhere new. It's, it's the power for service that you need. It's, it's no longer you doing it on your own power and your own skills and your own talents. It's you letting the wind of God blow you wherever God wants to take you. It could take you from California up to Oregon to be a pastor of a, of a church. <laughs> could take you to the bush in another country. Could take you back to your workplace with boldness and love. The fire. We will become new vessels of worship. They were there declaring the wonders of God, right? Even your children will, will prophesy. The little baby's trying to prophesy right now. Love it. Love hearing noises of babies in church. It means we're not a dying church. So there we go. Okay. Be prepared for wind and fire. The fire of God to create in us a heart and a passion for worship. To lay ourselves down. To be living sacrifices before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Maybe, maybe the purifying aspect of the fire of God might need to burn away some temporal things. Maybe we've been putting our attention into the things of this world. And God needs to kind of burn those away so the refining fire can keep us ready for God's move and God's mission here in our community. Or the, the fire maybe that we need to be prepare, prepared for is, is the wildfire that, that will take us places and give us impact that we never thought we would have. 
Again, looking around this, this church and all the different people who are in here, I've, I know people in here who've had impact on thousands of people's lives. I'm pretty sure when they were younger, they would have thought, I would have never had that. Well, that's because the Spirit is doing something powerful in your life, and you can have impact and influence here in this world, and it will spread like wildfire. It did in the first, it did right here after Pentecost. 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord, and then the gospel started spreading all over the world. One message, Jesus was raised from the dead, and one power, the Spirit moving and working in a community. So be prepared for wind and fire. When the Holy Spirit begins to move in your life, don't be surprised if you, received, if you receive mixed reactions. Okay? There on the day of Pentecost, some people were amazed, right? Whoa, what is going on? I'm super amazed right now. They didn't say that, but the text said it. Like, I'm amazed at what's going on. These Galileans, these regular old blue collar folk are speaking in my language. This is great. Anyone ever had that? You start talking to people about what the Spirit is doing in your life and you're like, man, that's amazing. That's great. I love that God is doing that. Right? But then in the very, another conversation, you can go and tell, you know what? God's been moving in my life. In fact, there's, there's areas that have been strongholds in my life that God has been breaking down. I'm having freedom in it. And you're telling someone this and I'm like, you said, Holy Spirit, What? I'm just super confused right now. What is God doing? How is that a bad thing? Especially in our world where any truth is anything and anything can mean anything for anybody. How is that a bad thing? How was, I don't get that. What you were doing before seemed to be great. I do that every day. What about accusation? <laughs> Man, you think you've had a little too much Holy Spirit this week, okay? All right, maybe you've had a six pack of the Holy Spirit and that's just a little too much, right? You get accused of, of being like a holy roller or just so focused on the Lord. You get just accused of, of whatever, you, whatever it is. I'm sure we've at some point in our life when the Spirit starts to move, people have reacted in certain ways to us. Oh gosh, all you want to do is talk about God. All you want to do is talk about Jesus and what he's doing in your life. Oh, like, and, or maybe mockery and make fun of, oh, there's those Christians over there, Right? But it kind of begs the question, when was the last time praise and worship in this church community has caused people on the outside to go, what does that mean? And why are they doing that? And then we go, well, come on. Jesus is raised from the dead and the spirit is alive in our community. Again, my whole point in saying this is, is uh, don't be surprised if you get mixed reactions. The apostles and the disciples, the very first people who received the powerful gift of the Spirit, faced all of that. Amazement, confusion, bewilderment, accusation, and mockery. All right, so if those things come to you as the Spirit starts to move in your life and you start to follow Jesus more wholeheartedly, you might get those mixed reactions from people who are, who are close to you, people who don't know you, and it might be difficult and it might try to get you off course, but I want you to don't be surprised when it happens because when the Spirit starts to move, those people who don't understand what's happening in the Spirit will bring mixed reactions. We can't be surprised if it happened to, to the 12 disciples plus the other 108. It said that, that the 12 were there, or Peter and the 11, which... 1 plus 11 is 12. Okay, you did, got, got that right. All right, and then it said, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all the other women. So it's probably 12 men and 108 women to make 120 because women are so faithful to the Lord. Um, but again, if they experienced all that, don't be surprised if it happens to you. The third thing is ex when the Holy Spirit starts to move in your life, expect powerful transformation. The Holy Spirit is not some seasoning you put on top of the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is all of the Christian life. God wants all of you, not part of you, not a certain compartment of your life. God wants all of you or none of you. There is no middle ground. Life can never be the same when you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It can't be the same. When God's Spirit fills you and transforms you, life can never be the same. Look at Peter. 50 days earlier in the garden when, when, they, when Judas betrays Jesus, Peter pulls out a, pulls out, um, a sword and he goes to swing and tries to, tries to kill one of the guys trying to arrest Jesus, misses him horribly and cuts off his ear. I wonder if Jesus was like, where did that come from? Was like, you've been carrying a sword this whole time? Anyway, I thought I'd maybe throw a fishnet on him or something. But anyway, he grabs a sword. He didn't want him to arrest Jesus. And he swings as hard as he can. Misses, doesn't, yeah, he's just horrible. Misses the guy, cuts off his ear. Ears on the ground. Really weird scene. Jesus reaches down, grabs a bloody ear and goes, 
oh. Well, there's no ah, but you can imagine. It's, you know, the movies, like some glow happens and he's like, my ear's back. And Jesus looks and is like, Pete, are you serious? Am I leading a rebellion? Right? He can't swing a sword to end someone else's life to save Jesus's. Now, Peter stands up with the sword of the spirit and cuts to the heart of 3,000 people. Powerfully transformed. A guy who's always willing to open his mouth to stand up for the 12 is now, uh, when, when he wants his own purpose, to the point where he, he's called Satan by Jesus. And now Jesus is saying, I want you to use your mouth and I will anoint it with the spirit of prophecy and you will go and you will witness to my resurrection. You will see the world changed. Peter is not the same Peter that he was when Jesus was here. Now that he has the other advocate, now he's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, he is totally transformed. Interesting what he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. Jesus, the first thing he says is repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the very next chapter, chapter three, Peter will walk into the, near the temple and there's a guy who's been begging for, for healing or begging for money for years and years. Jesus probably walked by him a few times and Peter goes down, him and John, and they're like, he's like, I don't got any money, but what I do have in the name of Jesus, walk, picks the guy up, he jumps and starts leaping and dancing. And the, Peter is now transformed, walking in the power of the spirit. What about Stephen in Acts chapter 7? Stephen will be stoned to death because he's, he's witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus. Looking to heaven, seeing the resurrected king of glory. He would have never done that before because when the spirit gets a hold of you, you're transformed. You're given boldness and strength. All the disciples throughout the book of Acts are totally different from who they were in the, in the Gospels. Remember when, when the, the wind and the waves, there's a story where the wind and the waves are crashing and Jesus looked and they're all scared on the boat. Like, ah! And Jesus is like, what's going on? Like, master, save us, save us. They were all scared because of wind and waves and now they're going into a Roman world proclaiming there's a new Lord in town. And seeing people come to Christ, seeing healings and miracles and proclaiming being stoned and becoming martyrs because Jesus is raised from the dead and they have been transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying we're all going to become martyrs, all right? But when the Spirit does fill you, fill you up and does empower you, the transformation will happen, and it's going to be radical, and life can never be the same. So as you look at the story, where do you fit in here? Are you ready? Are you waiting? Are you expecting the Spirit to move in power? Are you waiting to be filled again? Do you have the power for service? Do you have the, the words to share? Do you have the, the wind of God ready to take you where you need to go? Do you have the fire of God to, to, to give you, again, that the purity of heart that you need to go out and be Jesus to your community, to your job, to your world, wherever you are? And let's ask for more of that. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for, for pouring out the Spirit 2,000 years ago on Pentecost. And thank you that, that we find ourselves in the text when it says, for all who are far off. Lord, we are those who are far off from that story. So God, we ask for a fresh wind today. We ask for a fresh fire. Lord, we ask that you would pour your spirit out here in this place today. May our witness to your resurrection cause the world and the city around us to ask, what is going on in that church? What does that mean? And Lord, give us the boldness and the clarity and the love to answer correctly that Jesus is our Lord and we've been given power through his spirit to bring his mission to our community. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for not leaving your people alone, but for fulfilling your promise as a good father to send your spirit to help us live this Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, that does it for this Sunday. Um, as you're heading out, say hi to someone else who's a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we'll see you next week.